Welcome everyone. My name is Okay, so the lifetime risk of breast cancer is about 1 in 8 women or 12% of women will develop breast cancer. And unlike what most people think, most people who get breast cancer don't have a strong family history of breast cancer. And if you do have a strong family history of breast cancer, your risk is probably much higher than 1 in 8 women. Uh, the most, it's the most common type of breast cancer in women, and each year 192,000 um, women are diagnosed with breast cancer. Men can also get breast cancer, and there's about 2,000 cases in men each year, and a lot of these men do carry a gene, which we'll go into in a little bit. Um, if you look from 1930 to current time, breast cancer has actually decreased the mortality from it, and a lot of this is because of mammograms and early detection. Because if we detect cancers, and this goes for almost all types of cancers, in stage one or two, it's more curable than if we detect it at later stages. Um, the way breast cancer develops is it develops in the ducts or the lobules. The most common place for the breast cancer to develop is in the sorry, I'm going to take this cough drop out. Is in the duct. And if you look at this diagram. DCIS is stage zero breast cancer, and that's when you have cells that are limited to the inside of the duct. And basically, breast cancer happens when the cells leave the outside of the duct, and you can see that on the right in the um, diagram below that. Um, the symptoms of early breast cancer is the symptoms of breast cancer early on. It usually doesn't cause any symptoms. Um, early breast cancer most often is picked up on mammogram. If a tumor is growing and becomes a larger size, at that time, women can have pain, they can feel a lump, they can get dimpling in the skin, the nipple can change directions, and those are all signs that someone should be evaluated. Um, this, I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. If you look at carcinogenesis or the development of cancer, there's different places that we can intervene to prevent breast cancer. Um, the first one is to avoid the carcinogen or the causes of breast cancer, and we call that primary prevention. The second is chemo prevention or try to prevent breast cancer with medicines. And then the third is early detection or trying to catch it early at an earlier stage where it's curable, and we'll talk about all of these today. Um, primary prevention, examples of these for lung cancer would be to not smoke, to avoid the tobacco and carcinogen there. For colon cancer, it could be diet related with fruit and fiber. And for breast cancer, it's to limit exposure to estrogen. And there's known things from studies that we'll go into at the end of the talk, including exercise, limiting the caloric intake, and maintaining a normal body mass index not smoking, and limiting alcohol intake. So these are all ways you can prevent breast cancer. Tertiary prevention is the purpose of cancer screening. So this is where mammograms and MRIs come into place. And if you detect cancer early, you can treat it and cure it and reduce death from breast cancer. So that's the point of mammograms. Um, cancer screening recommendations, there's several national groups that have recommendations, and there's been a lot of controversy over this. Um, these recommendations apply to the normal, everyday woman that's average risk. And if someone's high risk, we might increase surveillance in these. So um, for breast cancer, the recommendation is to start mammograms. It's, the consensus is definitely between age 40 and 50 in every one to two years. Um, 50 and older, the consensus is annually with all these groups. Um, at Baylor College of Medicine, we strongly believe in starting mammograms at age 40 and yearly. And there are some studies coming out that do show that, it, that, that you can catch more breast cancers earlier and save lives by starting breast um, screening at age 40. The question is whether that's cost effective or not, and that's a lot of what the debate is over these days. Um, we do still recommend breast self exam starting at age 20 and older. And you know, there's not a consensus about whether this really does find breast cancer earlier or not. I think if people are taught to how to do breast exams and to look for new masses, and if they do them regularly and know their breasts, that this really is a good tool, especially for younger women that develop breast cancer. Um, clinical breast exam is recommended um, annually for everyone age 40 and older. And they say every three years for age 20 to 40, but most people should be getting a breast exam annually with their gynecologic exam. Um, 
I kind of already talked about this, but this is kind of what the controversy is, is whether you should have mammograms after age 50. I'm not going to go into that today because I want to talk more about the hereditary breast cancer. Um, the other screening tool we use is breast MRI, and this is not for everyone. Um, breast MRI is used in high-risk groups, and there's actually recommendations that if someone's lifetime risk is greater than 20 to 25 percent, they should be screened with annual mammography. This includes people with BRCA1 and 2 mutations, women who've had DCIS or LCIS, and the reason for that is their risk is 1 percent per year. So if they have a life expectancy at least of 20 years, they may benefit from screening MRI. Um, the problem with MRIs and screening is some insurance groups choose not to follow the guidelines. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield is one of these, so I have not been able to get screening MRIs in people who have that type of insurance. Um, so what we need to do is identify individuals that are at high risk of breast cancer. And we base this on family history. If they have a strong family history, we may have an individual in their family who has cancer be tested for the gene. Or if none of them are alive, occasionally we will test unaffected people, and Sarah will go into that a little bit later. Um, people with pre-malignant lesions, and these include the atypical hyperplasia lesions, and people that had previous cancer are the ones that we consider high risk for breast cancer. Um, factors that increase your risk for breast cancer. Um, hormones is a big one. So the longer you are exposed to estrogen, the higher your risk of breast cancer. So these include things like early menses, never being pregnant, late menopause, if you were on hormones, that type of thing. Um, Pre-malignant lesions, these include atypical hyperplasia, um, lobular carcinoma in situ, ductal carcinoma in situ. There's genetic factors, including family history or having a gene. There are definitely some unidentified genes or maybe a combination of different genes that do put families at risk that we have not identified. And based on the family history, we would consider some of these patients high risk. Other factors include age, diet, um, alcohol use, smoking, someone's weight and race. Um, Caucasians do get more breast cancer than other races, but African Americans die more often from breast cancer. So the race puts you at risk for different things. Um, other countries um, or other races, such as Hispanic and Asian, when they're in their actual country and come here, their risk is, is less, but as they adapt to the Western culture, their risk approaches those of Caucasians and African Americans. Um, so one thing we use to help determine someone's risk is something called the Gale model. And this, is, um, this was developed by the National Cancer Institute, and it's used for women who do not have cancer. Um, this is a website for it. If you just Google Gale model, it'll come up as a link. And we use these, I, I don't run this on everyone because sometimes it'll come back high even in someone who probably doesn't, you know, I wouldn't even screen. So I use this in someone who has a family history of breast cancer or has had a previous um, breast biopsy. Um, and I know this is a little hard to read, but the questions, the first question that it asks is do they have a history of DCIS or LCIS? This model should not be used in patients that have a history of either of those. That's not the way the study was done. And then they asked for the age, what age they started menses, um, what was the age of the first pregnancy. If you've had a child before age 21, that's about 50% productive of breast cancer. So that's one of the reasons we're also seeing the incidence of breast cancer go up, is people are having children later, and a lot of people aren't breastfeeding like they used to, and that's also protective of breast cancer. Um, it'll ask how many first-degree relatives have breast cancer, has the patient had a breast biopsy, if so, one or more than one, and what did it show? Did it, was it benign or did it show atypical hyperplasia? And the atypical hyperplasia does put you at a much higher increased risk of breast cancer, and then it asks you race. Um, this model does perhaps underestimate the um, incidence for Hispanic and Asian women, and it tells you that in the model. Um, and this is an example. I put in a woman that was age 45, and her um, five-year risk of breast cancer was 5% compared to an average woman's of 1%. And her lifetime risk was 37.9% compared to an average woman of 11.9%. So I'll go into what this means, but this is someone I would offer tamoxifen, which is a medication that can reduce your risk of breast cancer by 50%. 
And I would also offer her um, screening with MRIs in addition to her mammograms every year. So if this woman came to see me, it would change her management and hopefully change her risk of breast cancer. So um, this summarizes what I just said. And um, tamoxifen is a good drug, and most people tolerate it really well. And there's even some studies that suggest that it can decrease, if you have atypical hyperplasia, the risk reduction may be as high as 70 percent. So the benefit is really big in people that have hyperplasia. So um, Sarah Ventac is going to take over now, and she's going to talk a little bit about hereditary breast cancer. And then I'll come back in and talk about tamoxifen and some of the things we can do to prevent breast cancer. Oops, sorry. Okay. Um, um, now I'm going to discuss the uh, familial or genetic contribution to breast cancer risk. Um, approximately 5 to 10 percent of breast cancer is hereditary. Uh, about 65 percent of this is caused by mutations in the BRCA gene, so there are other, um, there are breast cancer genes other than the BRCA gene. Uh, familial clustering occurs in about 15 to 20 percent of cases. This could be due to a combination of factors like genetics or shared environment or uh, similar um, lifestyle risk factors. Uh, we typically share a lot more than just our genetics with our family. There are several features of hereditary breast cancer. Um, these are, uh, we call them red flags, uh, several relatives with breast cancer in a family, multiple generations of affected relatives, um, suggesting something uh, being physically passed from one generation to the next, uh, premenopausal breast cancer, generally defined as being diagnosed before the age of 50. Um, individuals born with a genetic predisposition um, tend to be uh, affected younger than the sporadic cases. Rare cancers, such as male breast cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, or pancreatic cancer, bilateral breast cancer, and uh, individuals with multiple primary cancers, such as breast and ovarian. The BRCA genes are the most well-known uh, breast cancer predisposition genes. However, there are others. Um, the other syndromes often have different uh, clinical presentation, though, uh, um, compared to the BRCA genes. Some are associated with childhood malignancies. Um, others involve other organ systems or have dermatologic features. Uh, there are also unidentified breast cancer genes. There are many families that have a clear uh, familial pattern of cancer. However, they don't have mutations in any of the known cancer predisposition genes. Uh, keep in mind, we have uh, approximately 25,000 genes, and at this time we cannot test for them all, uh, but this list is likely to continue to grow over time. Let's review the BRCA genes and their role in hereditary breast cancer. The, the BRCA genes are very important because when normal, they are tumor suppressor genes, uh, protecting the body from breast, ovarian, and other cancers. Mutations in the BRCA genes cause loss of function. Um, and specifically, this causes defects in DNA repair, and this leads to the increased risk to develop cancer. Uh, they are inherited as autosomal dominant, um, and I'll go into uh, more of this later. There's more than 3,000 different mutations reported, and this is because most families have unique mutations. The exception is with um, populations that have founder mutations, most notably individuals um, of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry have a 1 in 40 background chance of having a BRCA gene mutation. And there are three common mutations in this population. Uh, to put it in perspective, everyone else has about a 1 in 750 uh, background chance of having a mutation. The cancer risk is most concerning for females carrying uh, BRCA gene mutations. However, uh, men are also at risk for BRCA-associated cancer. Men have a 2 to 8 percent chance of developing breast cancer and are also at risk for cancers such as prostate, pancreatic, and melanoma. Uh, women carrying mutations have a significant risk to develop breast and ovarian cancer. This is most pronounced with the BRCA1 gene, which generally has been associated with the higher um, estimates of cancer risk. 
the BRCA1 cancers are more likely to be triple negative, and they are often um, diagnosed in premenopausal years. The BRCA ovarian cancers are typically of um, steric pathology. I show this slide um, to highlight that 30 to 50 percent of women with BRCA mutations will develop the breast cancer in their premenopausal years. This is one of the most prominent features of the BRCA gene. There are always exceptions, but families that only have postmenopausal breast cancer typically don't have a BRCA gene mutation. Ovarian cancer is uh, in the general population, very rare. However, it's one of the red flags that we look for um, when evaluating a family for a BRCA gene mutation. One difficulty is that ovarian cancer is also one of the most misreported cancers in family history. People oftentimes do not know the difference between cervical, uterine, and ovarian cancer. Cervical and uterine cancer um, are much more common than ovarian cancer and, in general, are not associated with BRCA gene mutations. Uh, this makes an accurate risk assessment difficult if ovarian cancer is being overreported in the family. Part of my role in clinic is detailing the family history with construction of the pedigree. Many of you have seen these diagrams. Uh, circles are women, squares are men. Um, the arrow points to your patient, and people with cancer are uh, generally shaded in some fashion. Uh, this diagram assists with the risk assessment, and if a mutation is found and you follow multiple family members in your clinic, the family tree helps to keep the relationship straight. Uh, this is a screenshot of the BRCA Pro program we use in clinic. Um, it's a valuable tool that calculates the likelihood that an individual has a BRCA gene mutation based on their personal and uh, family history. We routinely use this in the risk assessment uh, process as well as um, as a patient decision aid. The NCCN has issued guidelines on who should be referred for genetic risk assessment. They're long and a bit complicated, and they differ for individuals with a personal history of breast cancer versus those who are unaffected but have a family history of cancer. But in general, what you're looking for are the red flags that I mentioned before. Who pays for genetic testing? Um, this is an important question because genetic testing is expensive. Um, for example, the comprehensive BRCA test is now costing over $4,000. Um, the major health in, uh, insurance companies generally have good coverage for both affected and unaffected individuals. Um, and they all have their own specific criteria for testing. Medicare and the Texas Medicaid um, also have specific um, criteria for when BRCA gene testing is covered. However, they do not cover testing in the unaffected individual. Um, there are options for the um, uninsured, uh, specifically for BRCA gene testing. The Myriad Lab has a program for uninsured individuals. Um, if they meet certain uh, clinical and financial criteria, uh, Myriad will waive the cost of testing. Now I'd like to review the management recommendations and options available to women who have BRCA gene mutations. Uh, breast surveillance is recommended to start at age uh, 25 and to, and to continue annually um, because the BRCA-associated breast cancers uh, can be seen in very young women. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to um, stress the importance of the breast MRI in these women. In a surveillance study of BRCA carriers, they found that clinical breast exam and mammogram only caught 45% of breast cancers in this population. Uh, the addition of breast MRI and ultrasound increased the detection rate to 95%. This study showed, oh, the images aren't coming through. No, nope, back up one. Sorry about that. You guys are. This in the graphs on this one. Um, 
but um, take my word that this study showed that <laughs> annual surveillance for breast MRI um, is associated with a significant reduction in the incidence of advanced stage breast cancer and BRCA mutation carriers. That means that an increase that means an increased chance of survival. So you can turn it around. Oh, your paper. Your paper. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, that's not going to show up. Basically, <laughs> <laughs> you know um, so basically, what, what the graphs are showing you is that they followed um, they followed bracket carriers who were unaffected, and they followed one group had mammogram and the other group had mammogram and MRI, and some of them, as would be expected, developed breast cancer. The, however, when you divided the two groups into stage zero to stage two and in stage um, sorry, three and four, what we found is that the folks that had MRI were more likely to be diagnosed at early stages versus the folks who only had mammogram were, were the ones who were more likely to be diagnosed at those advanced stages. So uh, in conclusion, it's very important that, the, that BRCA carriers get the breast MRI in addition to the mammogram so that if they are to develop cancer, um, it's found early, um, and they have a better chance at survival. And the breast MRI is covered um, by insurance for women who have breast mutations. Okay, so BSCA mutation carriers are also recommended to have their ovaries removed by age 40. This not only reduces their ovarian cancer risk, but is associated with a significant reduction in their breast cancer risk as well. Uh, these women do go into immediate menopause, and some of them have pretty extreme symptoms. The temporary use of low-dose ERT um, does not negate the protective effects of the oophorectomy, and is sometimes used for balancing quality of life. Um, the prophylactic mastectomy is obviously associated with a substantial um, reduction in the incidence of breast cancer um, in this population. This is an option for women wanting the greatest risk reduction, and the surgery and reconstruction are covered by insurance. Okay, I'm not going to give you a lecture on molecular genetics, but I just wanted to mention the difference between sequencing and rearrangement testing and how it's important. Uh, the way I explain this to my patients um, is that a sequencing test is like running a spell check on your genes. If you have a small error in your gene, like a few chemicals are missing or one chemical in the place of another, um, just like a spelling error, the sequencing test will pick this up. However, if you have a big segment of your gene missing, like a large multi-exon spanning deletion, the sequencing test will not pick it up. Much like your spell check would not alert you if you accidentally deleted a paragraph from your document. It only checks what's there, not what's missing. In the BRCA test, um, the, in BRCA testing, the test to um, detect the large rearrangements is called the BART test. Um, approximately 2 to 7 percent of high-risk women will have a BART mutation. However, the implications or the cancer risk are the same for women women who have a sequencing mutation and for women who have a BART mutation. If the familial mutation is known, then family members should have single site testing for that specific mutation. Um, it's very important to know the specific familial mutation because if it is a mutation only detected by BART and the sequencing test is ordered instead on those family members, it will result in false negative results because that family's mutation is only picked up by the BART test. Okay. The BRCA genes are on chromosome 13 and 17. Most important to note is that they are not on the sex chromosome, which means that mutations are carried by and inherited through both men and women. This also means that dad's side of the dad family history is just as important as mom's family history when evaluating for BRCA risk. This also illustrates how all of our genes come in pairs. We get one from mom, one from dad. This is where we get the 50% chance for a parent to pass on a mutation to their children. If someone has a BRCA mutation, they actually have one normal copy and one abnormal copy. 
Uh, they pass one copy onto their children, much like tossing a coin, 50-50. Heads they got it, tails they didn't. <coughs> we have wonderful services for uninsured women in Harris County through the Ben Taub Hospital. Uh, we have a dedicated prevention clinic on Tuesdays that Dr. Nangia and I staff, where we follow high-risk women, as well as the uh, women for risk assessments due to their family history. We also have a breast oncology clinic every Wednesday, which is staffed by Baylor Clinic physicians. <coughs> uh, and we are excited for our survivorship clinic, which will open in the fall of this year. I would stress to patients and healthcare providers that the goal of genetic testing is cancer prevention and early detection. If we can figure out what's causing the cancer in these families, maybe we can stop the pattern from continuing. Some of these families really have been decimated by cancer. There are ways to reduce the risk. An early diagnosis does mean a better chance of successful treatment. And I am going to turn it back over to Dr. Nomia. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about, Sarah talked about the BRCA carriers and predatory breast cancer. And I want to emphasize that it's really important that if you see a patient that's under the age of 50 and has a family history of young breast cancer, they need to be seen by a real genetic counselor and get a risk assessment. Um, we've had a few cases where people were seen in the community and Sarah mentioned that BART testing and that wasn't ordered because people who aren't certified genetic counselors may not know about the test and how to order it properly. So it's important that you see someone that knows this area very well if your family's at high risk. Because as you can see, if we added screening MRIs and do the oophorectomies, it can really help these women a lot and prevent breast cancer or catch it in an early stage where it's curable. Um, there's also a lot of um, women that don't have a known gene but are at a high risk because of a breast biopsy that showed hyperplasia or a strong family history with a negative genetic test. And for these women, um, there's other things we can do. I want to emphasize um, lifestyle and behavioral changes, and we'll go into specific studies. Um, more aggressive screening, including breast MRIs. Um, chemo prevention with medications such as tamoxifen or raloxifen, and prophylactic surgery. So almost 40% of breast cancer can be prevented by lifestyle. And these include um, maintaining a normal body mass index, being physically active, at least three to five hours of exercise per week, limiting alcohol intake to less than three drinks per week. And in people that drink alcohol, um, folic acid has also been shown to help reverse some of those effects and encourage breastfeeding. Um, for diet, it's more calories than fat or specific content from the studies we've taken. And a lot of that has to do with weight intake. You have to, um, to stay thin and healthy, you have to reduce your caloric intake. Um, there hasn't really been shown to be a specific effect from fruits, vegetables, fish, fiber, or caffeine. There may be a modest association with red meat, although that's not been proven one way or the other in studies. Um, there's no risk reduction from decreased fat intake from the Women's Health Initiative study. And we know that the Western diet compared to other countries is associated with an increased risk of death from other causes as well as from breast cancer. Um, we can go to the next slide. This is the Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, alcohol is also a consistent risk factor in multiple studies. And you can be at an increased risk of breast cancer with as little as three drinks per week. And this risk was shown in a study to be decreased by taking folic acid. And the dose is 800 micrograms per day. It's just a vitamin. It's the same thing pregnant women take to prevent um, birth defects. And it is a dose response. And the way this works is because alcohol increases estrogen. And we know that people who are overweight, the fat gets converted into estrogen through different pathways. And that's why weight increases your risk of breast cancer as well. Um, it also increases your risk of recurrence. And this is a slide that shows that. On the bottom of the graph is the alcohol intake in grams. And on the left side is your relative risk of breast cancer. And as your alcohol intake increases, your risk of breast cancer also increases. Um, 
Now we'll talk about exercise. There's many studies that show that exercise may reduce the risk um, of breast cancer and death. And um, these are two of the papers. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, this is the one that I like to um, talk about. It was in JAMA in 2003. And in this study, they show that exercise, even walking three to five hours a week, will decrease your risk of breast cancer. And the more you exercise, the more you decrease your risk of breast cancer. And this is independent of weight. And so it's important, because if you walk just three hours a week, that's not going to make you lose weight. But there's healthy changes that happen in your body from it. And part of it is that it decreases estrogen in the body, and it decreases insulin. And there's some recent research that shows that people that are insulin resistant, which you also get when you're overweight, um, are at an increased risk of breast cancer. Part of that might have to do with the immune system. And um, if you look at this graph, um, the black line on the bottom is a BMI of less than 23. Normal is between 20 and 25. Overweight is 25 to 30. And over 30 is obese. And if you um, morbidly obese is over 35. The red line is greater than 35. And it's the same graph. The bottom is time, and the left is um, recurrence in patients that have had breast cancer. And people that weigh more are, are at an increased risk of recurrence from breast cancer. And they are studies that show if you lose weight, your risk of breast cancer decreases. So it's never too late, even if you've had cancer, to make lifestyle changes, lose weight, and decrease your risk of breast cancer coming back. Um, prophylactic surgery is definitely the most effective way to reduce breast cancer risk. It is very radical and not recommended for everyone. Um, we do recommend it for people that have a very strong family history of breast cancer. Um, I have some patients that do not have a known BRCA or BART gene, but their lifetime risk on multiple models will come back more than 60%, something like that. And we do in them agree with them having prophylactic mastectomies that that's what they want. Um, for people that are BRCA carriers, a prophylactic mastectomy will decrease their risk of breast cancer from as high as 85% to 2 to 3%. And the reason it's not 100% is when you do a prophylactic mastectomy, you can't remove all of the breast tissue. Depending on the surgeon skill, up to 10% of breast tissue can be left behind. So for BRCA carriers, we usually say they have a 2 to 3% risk of breast cancer after surgery. And someone who doesn't have a gene, it would be much less than that. Um, the, the, these studies were all done with traditional mastectomies. And now we have skin sparing and nipple sparing mastectomies, which a lot of people like because you preserve sensation then, because the breasts are a sensual organ. And it's hard for a young woman to go through a surgery like this. Um, we don't know the exact numbers if they have a skin and nipple sparing mastectomy, but it's probably less than 10% risk and, you know, somewhere between the 2 and 3% and 10%. Those numbers aren't known, but it's still much less than the 85% risk they would have been at otherwise. Um, so secondary, you know, we talked about primary prevention being the lifestyle changes. Um, secondary prevention is um, preventative therapy such as medications or vitamins to reduce the development of cancer. In breast cancer, there's two medications that are approved for chemo prevention, tamoxifen and raloxifen. And um, these are called the CIRMs, or selective estrogen receptor modulators. And they basically block estrogen in the breast, which will decrease your risk of breast cancer by 30% or more, depending on the situation. And they increase estrogen effects on the bones and cholesterol. So raloxifen is also known as a vista, and it's actually used to treat osteoporosis. So you get the good effects of estrogen on different parts of your body. Um, so this, um, there's two studies. This is the first one, and it was the NSABPP1 study. And this took women aged 35 to 70, pre- and post-menopausal, who had a risk of more than 1.6% based on the Gale model, what I showed you in the beginning of the talk. And they were randomized to either tamoxifen 20 milligrams a day or a sugar pill for five years. And the endpoint was the occurrence of breast cancer. And I'm sorry, the bottom part's not showing up very well, but people that were on tamoxifen had a 49% reduction in breast cancer. So almost 50% risk reduction with taking the medication. 
Um, I'm not going into the other studies, but there have been studies that show that five years is the right amount of time to be on the medicine. If you're on it for less time, it's not effective. And if you're on it for much longer, you get a lot of the side effects with not much more benefit. Um, the second study I'm going to show you is the P2 trial, or the STAR trial. And this is a trial that randomized people with the like, AL risk score of 1.7 or you know, greater than 1.6 to either tamoxifen for five years or raloxifen for five years. And they were both equally effective in reducing the risk of breast cancer. The caveat to this is with raloxifen, there was less side effects. And I'll go into the side effects in just a minute. But there was more precancerous lesions. And tamoxifen, um, they both prevented the same amount of invasive cancer, but tamoxifen had less of the precancerous lesions. So most oncologists prefer tamoxifen over raloxifen, unless if a woman is very concerned about side effects, and then we'll put them on raloxifen. Um, the side effects from tamoxifen, what most people feel if they're young under age 50 is hot flashes, vaginal dryness. Um, the two big risk factors we worry about is there's a 1% risk of blood clot, and that's kind of like birth control and estrogen effects on the blood vessels. And there's a 1% risk of endometrial cancer. And the um, endometrium is the lining of the inside of the uterus, and that's stimulated by the estrogen. So a sign of that would be vaginal bleeding. Um, all of the women who developed endometrial cancer in the studies were cured with a hysterectomy. And 99% of people would not have either of these problems, but they're serious side effects. And some women will not want to go on the medications because of these side effects. Um, that's, I, I usually, if someone has atypical hyperplasia, their gale model is going to come back high risk, no matter what any other factors they have. And those women, some studies have even showed up to a 70% reduction in their risk of breast cancer. So I usually do encourage them to at least try the tamoxifen. And if they can't tolerate it, then they don't have to be on it. It is a prevention medicine. Um, there's many more studies. Um, the more trial, the IBIS, and they show very similar results. Um, all of these, the range was between 30 and 70 percent. What most oncologists will quote is the 50 percent risk reduction. Um, the important thing to note is that in people that have had a breast cancer, and the breast cancer was ER negative, they don't get benefit from the tamoxifen and raloxifen, with the exception of BRCA carriers. Um, BRCA carriers do have some benefit from these because they're at risk for second or third breast cancers. And the um, BRCA1 tends to get ER negative, but BRCA2 tends to get more ER positive breast cancers. Um, we do not have any good medications to prevent ER negative breast cancers at this time. <coughs> and um, this is one of my last slides. And this is just showing that there's a lot of research being done in different medications to help prevent breast cancer. Um, COX-2 inhibitors are being looked at. Um, for other therms, which are the selective estrogen receptor modulators, aromatase inhibitors are used in the treatment of breast cancer. And the studies are now going on in the prevention of breast cancer. And that's a medication used in postmenopausal women that has less side effects that are serious, like tamoxifen. So it's very encouraging. And in breast cancer patients, aromatase inhibitors are actually a little bit better than tamoxifen. So the hope is they'd be better in preventing breast cancer as well. Um, there, new targets are things um, like tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, kinase inhibitors, and retinoids. And these target transcription that can cause some changes that put people at increased risk of breast cancer. But none of the studies that have been done today are you know, medications or drugs that are ready for prime time at this point. And a lot of the problem is, since these medicines are for prevention, if a drug has a lot of side effects, they're not going to be approved as a prevention medication. Um, the other problem with prevention medications is to get to have a successful trial, you have to have several thousand patients. And they take a lot of time and money to do. And nowadays, there's not as much money to put into clinical trials. So prevention trials are kind of taking a back seat to actual treatment trials. And we're trying to change this. They're just difficult trials to do. So um, conclusions, um, cancer prevention strategies and improved treatments are having an impact. Um, overall mortality from breast cancer is decreasing. And a lot of this has to do with awareness, mammograms, um, women like everyone listening, being advocates, and getting the word out to the community. Um, 
There's a lot of um, new screening techniques like MRIs, and these have been shown in BRCA carriers to reduce mortality and um, increase early detection. And there's better risk assessments. We're identifying more people that have genes in their families, identifying more patients that are high risk, and getting them into the right places. Um, now they're starting to profile tumors, and hopefully we'll have some new targets and new drugs come out. So there is hope that one day we'll be able to hopefully prevent or cure all breast cancer. And I think that's it. Um, if you guys have questions, Sarah and I are always available. Our emails are here. I usually am at all the breast health collaborative events, so just let us know. Um, the other thing is we do a lot of work with the county patients at Bentob. And for affected patients that actually have cancer, we've been able to get genetic testing on almost all of them that we think need to have genetic testing. So if you ever feel like there's someone who might need it, just call one of us and we'll try to get them to you. Any questions? I have a question. Did, did, did most of your testing go up to Salt Lake City to area genetics? There are. Yeah. yeah. All of it does, pretty much. <laughs> Yeah. The so the question was, um, do all the tests go up, go to Myriad um, at Salt Lake City? Um, Myriad is currently the only lab um, that does BRCA testing um, in the United States. There are other labs around the world that do it, but due to some patenting laws, they are currently the only game in town. So yes, all of our BRCA testing goes to Myriad. Do you have a record? It looks like there's a yes. record. Yes. Uh, so, two two questions. One, I heard insurance covers MRI, but does Medicaid? It depends on um, the type of Medicaid. If someone has a known BRCA mutation, I've never had a trouble getting an MRI covered, no matter what the insurance is. The problem is nowadays a lot of people are choosing to have insurance plans that have very high initial deductibles, and they're having a hard time affording that. But even at Bentob, if someone has Medicaid or is unassured, we can get breast MRI. So if someone has a known gene mutation, it's not difficult. If we're trying to get them screened under a lifetime risk, it's more difficult. And if you don't have a very good insurance plan or if you have Blue Cross, it may, it may not be covered. It's based on individual insurance plans. Okay. And then the second question from, from the, it was the Dollar study. Uh huh. Uh, so after all that was completed um, and, you know, it showed tamoxifen did help prevent uh, higher risk cancers, but getting that out into the community, regional doctors, community doctors, um, that I know has been a problem. It, have you seen any changes in the thought of our community doctors in recommending tamoxifen? Um, I think you're exactly right. I have seen more referrals come in, and a lot of it is through awareness programs like this where people are like, oh, what is the Gale model? And then getting physicians to take the time to either run the Gale model in clinic or send them to us. I know Harris County is working on a patient navigator system. Um, I know they're working on different navigation systems where they could try to get it more into primary care in the clinic and actually have the patients run it, but you're absolutely right. There's not enough awareness that that's out there. Um, when we do see someone who has a breast biopsy that shows atypical hyperplasia, I would say at least 90% of those patients are making it into a high-risk clinic because there is a lot of awareness in radiology departments about that. Jenny? Jenny? Yeah, there any other? Just raise your hand if you do. Okay, Jenny, yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, as a collaborative effort, we could be, you know, trying to get that message out to community doctors that, you know, the, the low risk on a blood clot or um, endometrial cancer, um, surely it outweighs the beyond tamoxifen if you're at higher risk. No, I agree. I agree. And we are trying. And that's why I come and try to do programs like this. Um, Jenny, did you have a question? Yeah, this has been great. Do you know what the percentage of um, women that are recommended to take tamoxifen as a prevention me method are actually taking it? Um, 
So in my experience, you know, at the county clinic, I actually have more women that take it in the pri than in the private clinic. And I would say about probably three-fourths of the patients I recommend it at the county clinic do take it and follow up. Um, I've only been there since August, but in my experience, they're more willing to kind of do what the doctor recommends. In the private clinic, I'd say it's probably about two-thirds take it. And a lot of them, when you show them the numbers and explain to them that if they start taking it and they can't, you know, tolerate it, then we can stop it, a lot of them will at least try it. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, making sure they're aware of side effects, comfortable being on it, knowing what to look for. And is it recommended for five years? For five years. And you should be on it for at least three years to get any of the good effects from it. But when you look at, if we took a normal woman that was put on tamoxifen, and if we did a breast biopsy when they started and four weeks later, at four weeks later you could already see good changes in the breast from it. So, were there more questions in the room? I think a few people. Did you have a question? Okay. I have a question. Uh, this is Dwight, this is Edward. Uh -huh. And I just wanted you to, to uh, for a short time while we're waiting for other questions, kind of compare and compare the differences between genetic test like quantified DA and BRCA analysis, for example? So those are two very different things. A BRCA test is actually looking at a, for a gene that is inherited, and it's a defect in the DNA repair, and that's why you're at such a high risk. Oncotype is a test on an actual breast cancer specimen. And what Oncotype looks at is it does look at different genes. It's a gene that looks, it's a test that looks at 21 different genes. And five of them are kind of control genes. And then 16 of them are more proliferation genes. And the oncotype looks more at the biology of the tumor to decide if someone needs chemotherapy or not. It's not really a genetic testing type test. So they, they, both the tests do look at genes. But with BRCA, we're talking about an inherited genetic syndrome. And with oncotype, it's looking at the tumor biology to see if someone needs chemotherapy or not. Okay, one other thing. Are there any other questions from the... Yeah, uh, okay, go ahead, on the, on the oncotype, just to add to what Dr. Nongi has said, um, with the, the BRCA testing that I talked about, these are genetic changes that an individual would have been born with that would exist in each and every one of their cells. Um, what they're looking for in the oncotype test are acquired genetic changes. These are genetic changes that you would only see in the tumor itself. And then I think Lynn had a question. The BART that you had mentioned earlier is available at Baylor. And are there any other locations across yeah. the state? Yeah. So the, the BART test is actually on the BRCA gene. And so if it is genetic testing involving the BRCA gene due to the patent laws, the test is only available through Myriad Genetics. But um, to add on to that, sometimes the BART will be covered if you order it correctly initially with the BRCA testing, if they meet certain criteria, if you order it later on, it's $700. So it makes a big difference that they get a good assessment and it's ordered correctly the first time. Because sometimes Sarah and I have seen patients come in and they've had BRCA sequencing that a surgeon or a primary care doctor ordered, but they didn't order the BART test. And if they had ordered it initially, insurance may have covered the cost of it. Do you know what the qualifications for an uninsured low-income genome is like 150% below poverty level? Or for, the, for the uninsured myriad testing? Um, so myriad uses the um, Health and Human Services poverty guidelines, and I believe it's um, two times those poverty guidelines. And then there's also specific um, clinical criteria as well. And, it's like two or three pages of criteria. <laughs> but generally, um, you know, anybody under the age of 40, diagnosed under the age of 40, um, would qualify, you know, you know women, women with family history. Let me jump in here. We have people leaving the, uh, the webinar. But before you want to leave, I want to mention the, uh, uh, the evaluation of this program. Uh, please go to SurveyMonkey. There's a link that was sent to you and take the survey so that we can uh, hear what you think about uh, having a webinar like this and help us identify improvements for the future and topics, perhaps, that we can discuss in future web webinars. 
Uh, there is a question that like someone asked about lifestyle uh, prevention methods. Uh, are they effective in triple negative breast cancer? Um, absolutely they are. And you know, um, I think lifestyle changes is something I really want to emphasize because you can't change the genes you're born with, but you can change your diet, your alcohol intake, exercising. You can choose to breastfeed if you're a woman and have a child. And I think the lifestyle changes are so important and people underestimate the impact they can make. Um, we have observed at Ben Tobb that there's women who have many, many, many females and they come to us with you know, a very young breast cancer, so we do genetic testing on them, and they have a BRCA mutation. And family members of theirs that are affected but lived in Mexico or have a different lifestyle are unaffected. So the lifestyle changes, even with a genetic mutation, it seems like can make a huge impact. And we're trying to do some research in that area to see if we can, you know, target specific things in Mexico that cause some of these changes. Jenny, did you have one more question? Yeah, I just wanted you to clarify um, kind of the steps that y'all do in your clinic of if there's a high-risk woman, you see them, then they go to the genetic counselor to get, yeah, you know, and then it gets tested, and then they go back to the doctor, and maybe how it works, maybe if you don't have all those um, things in place. Yeah, so generally in the clinic, if someone comes in because of a family history of breast cancer and is uninfected, um, Sarah will see them first and throw out their pedigree. And then there's a program called BRCA Pro that we run that tells us the chance they would have a BRCA gene. Um, do you want to add anything else in that part? Or? No. And um, based on what their BRCA Pro is or what their pedigree looks like, we would recommend if they should or should not have genetic testing. Um, if there is someone alive in their family that has cancer, we generally recommend that the affected person be tested first. And if they come back with a gene, we would check our patient for that specific gene. And the reason for that is genetic testing is so expensive. And if we test an unaffected patient and they come back negative, there's still a chance that family could have a gene because there's only a 50% chance our patient would have inherited the gene. So we generally try to test the people with cancer first. Sometimes it's not possible because everyone has passed away or it's a small family. And in those cases, we do check the unaffected patients. And sometimes they do come back as carriers. Um, if someone comes to me because of multiple breast biopsies or atypical hyperplasia, I generally see them first. And if I feel like they have a strong family history and need an evaluation to see if they need genetic testing, I'll call Sarah and have her see them. So it just kind of depends the reason for the referral of why they were coming in. Does that kind of answer your question? And then um, if they're not high risk after seeing me, I generally send them back to their primary care or um, gynecologist. If their lifetime risk is more than 20% or I started them on tamoxifen, I generally see them at least every six months while they're on the tamoxifen. And then if they're a BRCA carrier, I see them every six months and we do yearly mammogram and MRI in them. So it just kind of depends how we're treating them. Any other questions? We're right over the o'clock now. I want to give a uh, great thanks to Julie and Sarah for providing this fantastic information and also for providing your email addresses. So please feel free to ask any additional questions directly to their email. And before we sign off, I'd like to mention that there are future programs. Uh, the one for June is the American Cancer Society panel. And in August, maybe September, the Breast and Cervical Cancer Control Program. And I encourage you all again to complete the evaluational survey monthly. And you can reach that link uh, through the email that was given. So thanks again to Julie and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Joyce. Mr. is there anything you want to say before we sign off? No, sir. Thank you very much for your uh, moderation expertise today. You've done an Thank excellent you. job. Thanks to all of our committee members for helping to make today possible, and especially to Lynn and Susan for allowing us to have this opportunity. We do have a small token of our appreciation for our speakers today. I, you guys can't see it, but we have some pretty bags that Lynn put together for them. So we will present them with that at this time. That's there. No other questions. Our call is officially over.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? We hope that was helpful. And if you guys ever are not sure 